Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read uh, verse number 3. We're continuing in our journey through the Word of God as far as, like the plan of salvation. The Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've, we've hit that quite a bit, but this morning, I'm going to probably nail it dead, to be honest with you, with these verses that we're going to go through. The, one of the biggest obstacles we have is our pride, if not the biggest. And we never want to admit that we're sinners. We never want to admit that we're wrong. We never want to admit uh, that we're guilty. And so a lot of times uh, the world uh, is rebuffed when somebody shows in the Bible and says, well, all have sinned. I mean, that's a no-brainer when you think about it. And when I, if you've been with me, I nod my head. I say, well, you know, I've sinned, you've sinned, he's sinned, we've all sinned. But a lot of times, many times, m- many more times than it used to be, people don't think they've sinned or ever sinned or they don't believe there is such a thing as a sin. And so one of the first, st- the first step that you have to, to uh, talk to people about is our sinful nature that we were born with. Everybody was born with a sinful nature. And in Romans chapter 12, verse number three, Paul's writing, he says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, watch this, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. The problem that we have, we have a wrong, most of us have a wrong perception of ourselves. We think too highly, like we deserve it, you know. I don't know if the Burger King commercial is still long, you deserve a break today. You know, you, you and I deserve hell to pay for our sin. You know, but we're so used to, you know, you deserve it. You go, girl, you get it. It's all yours. You deserve it. You won't find that in the Bible. The only thing we deserve is hell. The only thing we deserve is a payment for our sins. And it's only by the mercy of God Almighty, the grace of God Almighty, that we don't receive the punishment of our sins. So Paul writes here, not for us, you know, a lot of times we come to church and Unfortunately, people outside of church think that we're better than they are, or we, they think that we think we're better than they are. And you have to bust that perception of the lost person or the unchurched person by admitting that you're just, now I'm not saying you ought to broadcast your sin. I'm not saying you ought to telegraph your sin. I'm not saying you ought to advertise your sin. I'm not saying that. But everybody can admit that you've sinned. Everybody can admit that you've sinned against God, you've sinned against others. And that's the first step for any, not just relationship between you and God, but that's that's the first step for your relationship with anybody. Because everybody's made mistakes. Everybody's sinned. Everybody's erred. And everybody, if you're honest, has regrets of things in the past that you should have done or you should have said or you shouldn't have done or you shouldn't have said. All of us, if you're honest. So the first step is just acknowledging our position before God. And Paul writes, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. You know what God says we are? Dirt. You know what God says we are? Dust. You know what God says we are? The base. You know what base is? The lowest you can get, man. That's what we ought to think. We ought to recalibrate our minds into what God says. And I promise you this, I promise you, if you pay attention to this Bible study this morning, it'll change your perspective of life and your outlook on life. Like, I don't think we appreciate the blessings of God because we think we deserve more, we want more, we're greedy, we're envious at others. And so we we clamor, say, how come this happened to me? And why is this happening to me? And how come they're getting away with it? Well, you don't have the right perception of yourself. Because the Bible says you ought to think more, you ought to think you ought to think others better than yourself, Paul writes. Every person is better than you are. Every person is better than I am. You're not better because you hold a position or pastor, teacher, Sunday school teacher, usher, deacon, or any other religious uh, position. But a lot of times we think because we reach a position, whether it's in the secular world or not, we're a supervisor, we're a boss, or we're the owner, that has no bearing on the sinful nature of man. That's what I'm going to talk about this morning, the sinful nature of man. Let's go, let's go back to Romans chapter 3, where we started many, many weeks ago. Romans chapter number 3. And again, the first step in, in sharing the gospel is admitting, sharing what the Bible says that we're all sinners and admitting that we're sinners before God. Romans chapter number 3, 
in verse number uh, 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I think that includes you, don't you think? I think that includes every single preacher, don't you think? I think that includes every single priest, every, every pope, every bishop, every cardinal, every oriole. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. The only reason you're in church this morning is because of God. The only reason you're saved is because of God. Yes, obviously God used somebody to influence you, to be a blessing to you. But it was God that did that. I wouldn't be behind a pulpit preaching what I'm preaching and teaching if it wasn't for God. John Kalitas didn't come up with this book, and John Kalitas didn't write the book, and John Kalitas uh, isn't expressing his views. I want to make sure I line up with what God says because it's all God. All of us have sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, as we read before, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Take your Bible, please, turn with me to uh, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. We'll turn to a few Bible verses this morning. That's a good religious thing to do in the Baptist church. Psalm 51. Verse number one. What a great chap. I mean, they're all great. Don't misunderstand, but I'm telling you, they're just some, uh, and you have your favorites or verses or chapters, but I'm telling you, it's like this chapter just stands out, man. Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 51, verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Well, this is what David said. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Well, you can be forgiven of your sin, but all right, let's say you are negligent at work. Let's say you work uh, at a lumber mill, and let's say uh, you were working the bandsaw, and you put your hand in too far, and it cut off your arm from the elbow. You can be sorry about that. You can acknowledge it was your mistake. You messed up. You, shouldn't have, you should have waited till it was, it was off or unplugged. The power was off. I don't care how sorry you are. You're going to go around the rest of your life without a half, with a half an arm. It's ever going to be before you. And the consequences of all your sin, all my sin, are going to be before you. You, hey, you may have gotten victory over sin in the past, but what you sinned 5, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's going to slap you upside in the face sometime. You're even, even your enemy is going to remind you of your sin. Oh, yeah, I remember what you did 10 years ago? I haven't forgotten that. And you say that you're a Christian? Hey, you're gonna, it's going to be ever with you until we get to the judgment seat. It's going to be ever with you until eternity starts. And, God, and Paul's saying, uh, David's right. He says, you know, I acknowledge it. You know what? I messed up. You know my sin. Well, keep reading. For I acknowledge my, sin, my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Watch this, verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Did you read that? I don't think you understand what kind of miracle it is for you and I to be in a Bible-believing church this morning. Out of the depths of depravity, the chains of bondage and sin that we were caught in, that we couldn't break loose, God in his mercy broke it, amen? The, God broke the chains of temptation, the chains of sin, and here we are on a Sunday morning. You could have been anywhere else. You could have been in bed. You could have stayed home. You could have been at work or whatever. You're not here because you chose us. You're here because of God. If it wasn't for God, you wouldn't be in church. If it wasn't for, for the resurrection, we wouldn't be having a Bible, pre, uh, Bible study this morning and do a Bible study. If it wasn't for a heaven or a hell, if it wasn't for a decision that we make, had to make, we wouldn't be here this morning. But it was God that moved on hearts to, pre, to speak to you about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was God that broke your heart. 
It was God that humbled your heart. It's all God. I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me. You have anybody say, make me? Well, David says, make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. You know, God had to break your heart to get saved. You know, somebody said, I don't know who said, but you have to be, uh, when you hear the gospel, you're mad, sad, and then glad. You're mad because, what are you talking about? You think I'm a sinner? I deserve to go to hell? I'm not that bad. And then when you read what God says about all of us deserve to go to hell, and there's a payment to pay for that sin in hell, then you're sad. And then when you receive the gift of eternal life, salvation through Jesus Christ, you're glad. Well, you have to be glad that God broke you however he broke you. Whatever you were going through, you better be thankful to God that God let you go through that. How many times you heard me say this? I'm so glad I got saved before I finished. I was just about finishing court reporting school. Because I'm telling you, most court reporters have their nose up in the air. You know why? They make too much money. They drive nice cars, live in nice houses. They enjoy, and I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that. But once you get a lot of money in your pocket, once you got enough money in your bank account, and you got a nice four bedroom house, you know, AC, wall to wall carpet, two, three cars, a vacation home, and vacation anywhere you want, there's something that happens to the mind, say, you know, I don't need God, what, what do I need God for? And God worked on your heart before that time came to humble you and break you so that you could receive Christ as your savior. God did that with me, and God did it with you. And you ought to be thankful that he said, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. If you were here for the earlier Bible studies, once you're saved in the New Testament, uh, you're sealed until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is not leaving you, but in the Old Testament, it was a different application and a different um, Bible doctrine of the Holy Spirit, even though it was in them, they could lose the power of God like Samson and come back again. Where you and I have the power of God all the time inside of us. All the time. Verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's a guarantee from God. If you follow these 12, 13 verses here, God promises you, if you're humble, if, if you humble yourself and you stay and remain in a humble state, I'm telling you, God will lead you to lead others to Jesus Christ. And God will use you. Say, Pastor, I could never do that. Yeah, you could. You just don't realize it right now. Take a Bible, please turn with me to uh, uh, Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. Verse number 9. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. Watch this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. You know what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs? If you trust in your heart, you're a fool. That's what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. Because God very clearly says, the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Desperately wicked. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You don't know your heart. I don't know my heart, but God does. So we're supposed to live by faith. We're supposed to, to obey by faith. Because if we went by our heart and our emotion, we'd be a train wreck, man. We're up one day, down the next. We're happy one day, sad the next. We're glad one day, then upset the next. We're, we love somebody, then we hate them. That one day we're bitter, one day we're envious, one day, ah, it doesn't really matter, I let it go. That's, that's an emotional roller coaster ride that most people are going through today. But, if you believe what God says, the heart's deceitful, it'll deceive you. 
well, I'm just going with my feelings, Pastor. The Bible calls that a foolish thing to do, man. I'm going to trust my heart. God says you're a fool in Proverbs when you trust your heart. Why? Because the heart's deceitful. It's wicked. And I'm telling you, the enemy will use your emotion and your heart to deceive you to go contrary to the Word of God. Look, you do know why people drink alcohol. Because it makes them feel good. You do know why people take drugs, because it makes them feel good. You know why people do things that they shouldn't do. Sin is pleasurable, the Bible says, for a season. So if they do, why do they do it? Because it feels good. You and I shouldn't be doing things because it feels good. We should be doing things because we're supposed to, and God commands us we're supposed to do it by faith. Then after your duty, then you get joy. There's a, happiness is different from joy. Happiness is, is, is related to an action that, that when you do something, you're happy. You can be happy about a good thing or happy about a bad thing. But joy comes from God rejoicing about what God has done. Joy is, is rooted and based on faith, not just on a happenstance, a circumstance that makes you happy. People who win the lottery are happy. They don't tell you all the thousands of dollars they lost before they won the $20, $30, $50, $100, you know, jackpot. But I'm just saying people who, who are living in sin, whatever, you know, that means, and, and enjoying that sin, they're happy. People shacking up together, they're happy. P people who are uh, uh, robbing people, they're happy about it. They split the, the, the bounty there, the, the booty, you know, they say, here, you take half, I'll take half. They go into a house, they break into a car, they're happy about it when they get something. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's right. Take your Bible, turn to Lamentations, chapter number three. Right after Jeremiah is a small book of Lamentations, chapter number three. Lamentations, chapter number three. This would be a good verse for you to memorize in context of what we're teaching this morning. Lamentations, chapter number three, verse number 39. Wherefore, that's the old English word for why, doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins. So God's asking you, why are you complaining? You're alive, you're breathing, you're on the right side of the grass, you're not going to go to hell when you die, you're going to go to heaven when you die, you're going to be in all eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in a brand new body where there's no sin, no heartaches, and no, why are you complaining about anything? Yeah, but you don't know what happened to me, you don't know what he did, you don't know what she said. God asks you a simple question, why does a living man complain, amen? You, des you and I deserve hell. You and I deserve the punishment of our sins. And the fact that God's been so good to us and gracious to us and merciful to us that we're not receiving that, why are you complaining about anything in life? Pastor, you don't know how bad it's getting on my, in my neighborhood. I do understand, but why are you complaining about it? Start carrying, you know. Protect yourself, your family, and the other people in your neighborhood, amen. Or move out, I don't know. But why would you complain? Say, Pastor, you don't know my husband, and you don't know my wife. Well, you're the one that married him. I can't remember the last time somebody was forced to marry in an arranged marriage. You know, you're forced to marry a husband, you know. It's got to be 75, 100 years in this country at least. I mean, it probably happens in the Arab countries, I'm sure. But why are you complaining when you're the one that chose him or her? You decided to where you're going to work. Why are you complaining about your boss? Why are you complaining about your office? Why are you complaining about your fellow employees and your co-worker? Why are you complaining about that when you and I deserve hell? Why would, you, why would you ever complain a man for the punishment of his sins? But we're a bunch of complainers. I'm telling you, America, we, you and I have first world problems. You don't, you don't have any problems. You just think you have problems. You have made up problems. You're living, you're alive. Most people this morning walked in, maybe with a cane, you know, maybe with a limp, but you walked in. You're not in a nursing home. You're not strapped to a bed somewhere with an IV uh, filling you up with something. You're in church this morning and yet we complain. You live in the greatest country in the world, as bad as she is, 
as far as he's fallen. We're still the greatest country in the world right now as far as liberty is concerned. I'm not, I'm not, I could care less about the military power. I could care less about the financial wealth. I'm more concerned about my liberty. But yet we complain. I know how bad it's getting. I know, I know, believe me, it's going to get a lot worse. I'm telling you right now. But why should we complain? If we're safe from hell, we're not going to go to hell. Why? What kind of, what's your problem? Amen. You just think you have problems. Someone's been poisoning your mind. You've been evil affected. And someone's told you, oh, this is really bad. Well, you know, people say, well, it's better than the alternative. Well, with us, Jesus is better, amen? amen. But for you, it's needful for us to stay here. And for others, it's needful for us to be here. Paul writes. Look at uh, verse number uh, 22. Chapter 3, verse 22. It is, the, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Do you, do you pray when you get up in the morning? Do you read your Bible when you get up in the morning? Do you pray before you lay your head on the, on the pillow? Do you read your Bible before you put your head on the pillow? His mercies are new. His faithfulness is new every morning. His promises are new every morning. And we neglect it. We'll watch the idiot box for three, four, five hours at a time, man. We'll go to a movie. We'll go see a show. We'll go to a cinema. We'll go to a concert. We'll think nothing about driving an hour or two away to hear our favorite band or go to our favorite concert, spend two, three hours there, go out to dinner somewhere another two hours later, then drive another hour back, take up the whole evening, you're exhausted and tired, and you're not even grateful that you're alive. And you can't take 15, 20, 30 minutes to read the Word of God. You see, something in the world is, is affecting you more than God. Look what it says in verse number 51. Mine eye affecteth, affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Your eye, what you see, is going to affect you. Amen. That evil, deceitful heart, that wicked heart we talked about in Jeremiah 17, your, what you watch is going to affect you, ladies and gentlemen. Look at verse number uh, 48. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. It, 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 if what you see going on in America doesn't break your heart, there's something wrong with you, man. Yeah. Something wrong with you. If, if you don't see what's going on in the streets and the, and the cities of America, the open border, and so it is a total invasion. It doesn't bother you at all? When the suicide rate is off the charts... Uh, the overdose deaths are off the chart. It doesn't bother you. But people are living in, in misery. They don't, people, children don't even know who their parents are or their dad is. It doesn't bother you? We're, we're so caught up with our own selves so much that we forget about others. Ecclesiastes chapter number seven, please. Ecclesiastes, chapter number seven. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. In the middle of your Bible is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes, right before Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes, chapter number seven. The same plan of salvation in the New Testament is found in the Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen. Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 20. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Did you read that? Amen. That includes you and I. That includes the Pope. That includes every single person. That's ever, that includes Mary. As godly as she was, as holy as she was, and thank God she was the mother who bore the Lord Jesus Christ uh, into life. She, she uh, was chosen by God because she was a pure, clean vessel, and thank God for her. But Ecclesiastes, uh, verse number 7, verse 20 says, There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. If you read about Mary in the Gospels that she was a sinner... And she had to obey the Levitical law to be cleansed 
after Jesus was born. The Bible says that she was unclean after, she, after Jesus was born. And she had to go through the Levitical uh, priesthood, the Levitical uh, uh, temple there to cleanse herself. Why? Because there's, per- there's not a just person upon the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now, you ought, to stop, you ought to try not to sin. I'm not saying, and this is what preaching is for, to keep you away from sin. Because sin bringeth forth death. The more you sin, the closer you're getting to death. So, you know, the second step, or third, yeah, the second step was the wage of sin is death. Well, the more hours you work, the more wages you're going to get. The more you sin, the closer you get to death. James says sin bringeth forth death. So why are people dying so early? Well, because they're sinning so much. Why are people dying of AIDS? For what reason? Well, they're sinning against God. Why are they overdosing? Why are they overdose de- overdosing deaths so high? Because they're sinning against God. Why are, are there so many drive-by shootings and young people dying? Well, did you ever read Proverbs where God says about the eye that mocketh his father and disobeys his mother? The, the, the eagle is going to pick it out? God's word is true. Let me tell you something. You go ahead and disobey God and sin against God, you're reaping death to yourself, man. Because there's not a person on planet earth. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That includes the preacher and everybody else. No one's exempt from this. And this is the first step you gotta, you got to explain to people, because some people, they're full of themselves. They don't think, I'm not, I'm not that bad. Well, let's see what God says. And then at, at that point, you'll understand. Again, I don't go through these verses with somebody at the door or t- stopping on the street. But if I have an opportunity... I'll go through all these verses. If somebody, they're self-righteous and I have the opportunity to talk with a friend or a relative and they, they give me an open door, I'm, I'm showing them these verses. Take your Bible, turn with me to uh, John chapter number three. The gospel of John chapter number three. Very familiar passage here, but it's often overlooked. Verse number 18. We'll start there in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse number 18. He that believeth on him, and we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here in John, chapter 3. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Now watch this, please. But he that believeth not... When you're a week old, you didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're a month old, you didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you were six months old, you did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he that believeth not is condemned already. That's what, that's what my Bible says. So the difference in being saved or lost, condemned or uncondemned, is believing. There's got to come a point in your life in your mind where you remember trusting Jesus Christ to save your soul from hell. You're not born a child of God. You're born a child of the devil, man, a child of this world that's against God. It's enmity to God. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse number 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So, Pastor, I, I tried showing people how to be saved. Well, why don't they want it? Because they love their sin. They love pleasure. They love uh, sinful behavior. They enjoy it until they get to hell. And they're going to wish to God they didn't... Uh, uh, reject Jesus Christ it'll be too late then because you ain't getting if you go to hell you ain't getting out man there's no such thing as purgatory there's no such thing as limbo that's man made religion to get money out of you that's a business man to extort money out of people playing on their emotions and your heart verse 20 for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That's why you say, Pastor, how come more people don't come to church? 
Well, they don't like the preaching of the old-time religion. They don't, like preaching, they don't like preaching against their sin. The flesh doesn't like that. The soul wants it, but the flesh hates it. Your flesh wants to stay in bed this morning. Your flesh doesn't want to serve God. You've got to force your flesh to do it. Look at the next verse, verse number 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. I don't want to go sowing, but I'm going sowing. I don't want to go to church, but I'm going to church. I, I don't want to do this, but God wants me to do it, so I'm doing it. And I'm telling you, when you stand before God, you'll be thankful that you obey God, not yourself and not your flesh. How many times have you ever gone soul winning? You didn't want to go. You're tired. You had a headache. Uh, something. You got, you're busy. But you went. Somebody got saved as a result. Either you handed him a gospel track or your, your partner did. And then you walk away and say, man, I'm glad I didn't listen to myself. I'm glad I listened to my flesh. I'm glad I didn't cave in. I'm glad I gave that person the gospel track. Well, that's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. You're going to have a t constant battle with your flesh for the rest of your life. The sooner you acknowledge how sinful we are, the better you can overcome the sinful um, handicap that we have with the flesh. But if you don't acknowledge it in the first place, you're, you're already a goner, man. You, you've already lost the battle. You've got to acknowledge that I'm a sinner, as, Paul, as uh, David wrote in Psalm 51. Look at Titus chapter number 1. Titus 1. Titus chapter number 1. A couple books before uh, Hebrews, I think. Titus chapter 1, verse number 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Watch this. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable people and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Well, that's a scary thought, man. Somebody who is, who is abominable and disobedient and a reprobate. Why? Because they rejected Jesus Christ to be their savior. That's where we were. That's where every single person was at one time. Uh, go to uh, Job chapter 15. Job chapter 15. Right before Psalms is the book of Job. Starting in verse number 14. The book of Job, chapter 15, starting in verse number 14. What is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Behold, he, God, putteth no trust in his saints. Did you read that? People who are saved, people who are born again are saints. Not who the Catholic Church says they are or any other church says they are. So we're going to... We're going to uh, say this person who lived uh, a thousand years ago is a saint. No, no. Anybody who's born again is a saint. You know what God says? He puts no trust in his saints. You mean God doesn't trust me? No, he doesn't. Amen. And you shouldn't trust yourself either. Amen. He put it, no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Watch this, please. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. Did you have orange juice this morning or water? Did you drink water yesterday? That's, that's what God says man is like. Drinks iniquity like he drinks water. I don't know. They say you ought to have about three, four tall glasses of water every single day. I don't know what the ounces are. It doesn't matter to me. I, I just drink it when I'm thirsty. Amen? amen. But, but the truth is, God says that's man like he's drinking water, he, he's drinking abominations and sin and iniquity to himself. That's how God looks at us. We're unclean. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? First John chapter number five. 
First John, chapter number five. I'm glad I'm saved, man. I still can't get over the fact that I asked Jesus Christ to save my soul. Nothing else in life is more important than being saved, man. People are full of themselves. The devils deceive them with riches, pleasures, money, power, favor, beauty. When they wake up at the judgment, man, it'll be too late. First John, chapter number five. First John, chapter number five. Verse number 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The whole world. There isn't a spot on the world that you can say, well, this is not wicked over here, man. I'm safe. I don't care if it's Jerusalem. I don't care if it's in your home. I don't care if it's in a church building. The whole world lieth in wickedness, man. It's a cursed earth since man fell. And that sinful nature passed from Adam unto all people. All have sinned, the Bible says. And you have to learn to deal with that. You have to learn to accept that because without that truth, you're going to go bonkers. So, Pastor, why am I doing this? I don't want to do it. Because you have a sinful nature. Paul had to say, you go ahead and read Romans chapter number 7. Paul had the same struggles that you have. Paul said, evil is within me, he said. It's in me. The things I do, I don't want to do. The things I want to do, I don't do. Paul had the same struggles that everybody has today in 2023. He just acknowledges that he was the chiefest of sinners. We don't. Well, I'm not that bad. You know, I go to church. I, you know, I don't rob anybody. I, I try not to be, live a bad life. I try to be honest. I'm not that bad. You won't find that kind of theology anywhere in the Bible. We're all sinful and we're all wicked. We're all evil. The only good you ever do is because of Jesus Christ. That's true even for a lost person. You're going to find out God gave them the breath that they didn't acknowledge. You're going to find out that God gave them the life that they didn't acknowledge. You're going to find out that God created them that they didn't want to acknowledge. Just because you don't acknowledge it or I don't acknowledge it doesn't mean it's not true. The whole world lieth in wickedness, the Bible says. All right, one more. I'm running late. John chapter number 8. The Gospel of John chapter number 8. It's like the first step. We've all sinned. I don't think we realize how wicked of, of sinners we really are. I don't think we realize how sinful the flesh is. I don't think we realize how evil, you know, it's, it's people's minds were evil affected by good things. If you re, re, rewound, the, rewound the tape of American history 20 years ago, Man, it was like a joy to be here. You read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. When he's walking down the streets of Philadelphia, he could hear gospel songs and hymns and Bible readings as he's walking down the streets of Philadelphia with the open windows as he's walking down the streets. Now, you are, if you lived in that kind of environment, you think, wow, the kingdom of God is coming. This is great. How can it get any better? Well, you didn't realize that God said the whole world lieth in wickedness. And it's only by the grace of God that you're saved. It's only by the grace of God that you read your Bible. It's only by the grace of God you come to church. It's only by God's grace. But too often we take the, gl the glory, we take the credit for, you know, how good I am, you know. I decided to come to church. I decided to read my Bible. I decided to do this for God. No, knucklehead, it was God. It was God. It was God. John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Verse 21, then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way and ye shall seek me and shall, this is very important, shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he said, whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. Now watch this. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That's three times in three, three or four verses, man. I mean, it's perfectly clear that Jesus said, and it's all through the Bible, you either die in Jesus or you die in your sins. If you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to die in your sins and go to hell to pay for your sins. But if, if you die in Jesus Christ, you know, those who sleep in Jesus... Man, we have eternal life, man. We have eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So the whole world lies in wickedness. We're born sinful. The heart's deceitful and wicked above all things. We have evil consciences. Man, I didn't even get to the other verses in, in the Bible this morning. But I'm just saying, I don't think we realize how filthy, wicked, and evil we really are. Because when we don't realize that, then we can't give God the glory for what he's done with dung. With what he's done with dirt. What he's done with dust. What he's done with the base things of the world that confounds the things that are mighty. And so, we, we, you know what we want to like to point people to? Well, yeah, I went to this college. I went to this university. You know, I, I scored pretty good on that test there. And, uh, yeah, I've been working here for 20 years, and I'm the supervisor there. And, uh, yeah, people come to me for advice and counsel, you know. It's all about us. It's all about me. You know, look how smart I am. Look how intelligent I am. And look at my experience that God gave you all that. That God Almighty gave you the ability, and God Almighty gave you the, the whatever attributes he's given you and the talents he's given you. But we like to steal that from God and say, well, you know, look, look I'm, I'm done, I've done pretty good for myself, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and God will curse you because of it. All right, let's close with, I guess, one more. Second Thessalonians. Uh, we read that last week, but 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 says, all men have not faith. We read that last week. All men have not faith. That's why we need to give the gospel to every person we can so they can die in Jesus and receive, receive Jesus Christ as Savior and then die in Jesus. All right, let's all stand, shall we? Father, thank you again for loving us. Thank you for church this morning. Lord, please bless the morning service to follow. Give safety for those still coming and bless the singing and the preaching. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.